Let me just give you the, the background to, to this. Um, Madeleine Williams, my chief of staff, and I were having a conversation just be, before Christmas, is when people were coming out of that period of mourning after the election, really. Um, we wanted to talk about, we wanted to get a group of people together, just to have a conversation about the, the future of the Labour Party and its future role. And we thought what we'd do is um, get a group of people, a small group of people together, well, you can see a small group of people together, uh, just to have that conversation. Um, and it was to try and keep it away from, to a certain extent, the fray of the hustings for the leadership, etc. So it's a bit of a calmer atmosphere, and maybe taking a, a, a longer view to a certain extent as well, but posing some of the questions that we need to address. And yes, feeding maybe into the climate for the leadership elections as, as well. And I was asking some basic questions about if we are, if our overall objective as the Labour Party is to achieve a Labour government that has the power to radically transform our society, to create that compassionate society of social justice that we aim for. If that is, well, there's a couple of basic questions we need to ask. First of all, do we fully understand the nature of our society that we operate in, we live in, we work in at the moment? And then secondly, do we understand about how we can change it, how we can win power to enable us to secure those changes? And they're the two basic questions, I think, that we need, need to address. Um, I, do, I published an article this morning um, which is basically saying that the nature of the society, we need to understand the nature of our society changes over time as well, and quite rapidly. You know, we live in a capitalist system. But that capitalism, I mean, uh, some years ago, we all read Ernest Mandel and late capitalism, etc. it's evolved. And in the 80s onwards, finance capital has dominated. In fact, it's dominated in such a way that production now is no longer the dominant element of our economy. It's, it's rent-seeking, the financialization of our economy overall. And we need to understand that. But also, since then, it's changed again. It's transmogrified again. We now have the, the power and influence of those who control data and who control and own media. And so, whereas a, uh, most of you are too young to most probably remember this, but we used to have debates around how capitalism was kept going, particularly in the US, around the, the military-industrial complex. Can anyone remember that? And it was the way in which military intervention and expenditure kept the finance system, the, the capitalist system going. And what we now have, I think, is a new formation which is about finance media, finance media data complex, in which, yes, the fin finance capital can exert traditionally its controls and influence over governments, individual governments and globally as well, you know, exercise their clout around investment or capital strike or whatever, and change policies, but also now linked with data and media ownership and influence can change policies even more effectively and even, as we must probably witnessed in the last election, can decisively influence elections as well. So we need to understand that's the capitalist formation that we now have dominant within our economy and within our society. And the second thing then is, well, how do you, how do you confront that? And I, I just threw out a number of ideas. Well, first of all, we have to recognize the traditional political party won't work in the same way maybe it did in the past. And I think most of you have, have looked, recognized quite a lot, few of you have been involved in this discussion that the Labour Party can't just be a traditional party anymore. It has to be that phenomenon of a social movement. So how do you build that social movement? And it is about yeah, grassroots community activity or communities of interest at a national level where people are brought together. And it ranges from some of the issues that we're debating tonight about how you confront some of the delivery of services within our society, but also right the way across, the equalities issues. The most remarkable and exciting work, I think, in the, in the recent period has been around disabilities and disabled people mobilizing, and also the breakthrough of on neurodiversity, where Labour actually came up with the Neurodiversity Manifesto for the first time in the last couple of elections. So, so I think that concept of the social movement we need to explore and examine fairly clearly now and develop it on. The second thing is, if you are going to build a movement, it can, should comprise members and supporters who actually do understand the world. 
And that does mean political education back on the agenda again. And the work of, I just praise them so much, the, the work of the World Transform movement, I think has been fundamental. It's a huge initiative of bringing people into political dialogue and discussion, but raising all our awareness about those issues and learning from one another. And I think that should be, we should be looking at how we generate that into a mass initiative now. And then I suppose the, the third then is, is in terms of how we, first of all, understand the world, how we educate each other about the world, then, is, then the, the detail about how we then translate that into discussions of policy that, that can be implemented to a Labour government, that we're able to communicate effectively. Because if there's anything about the failure of the last general election, and I took the hit for it and I accept it, is that we failed to have a narrative from 2017 to 2019 that convinced people and brought all our ideas together within a sustained narrative. And I think that's the issue that we need to address. How do we translate those individual policies that are poli extremely, extremely popular yet into a narrative that we can communicate? And part of that is what media platforms do we use? Now that finance capital is linked to a data capital, a media capital, that largely dominate, dominate the mainstream media in terms of the press, that then infiltrates itself in terms of the broadcast media. But also, we thought in 2017, well, don't worry, we can use social media, we can use the internet, and we'll democratise it. But that, that got colonised as well. If you look at Twitter now, colonised by the right, more effective, there was a gap in 2017 that we exploited. We've lost that pace now. So part of the, the way is how do we create new media platforms and how do we develop them and how do we ensure that actually, yes, we recognise we are in a culture war where every word, every metaphor, every understanding is absolutely a battleground between us and the right. And how do we use, yeah, traditional culture in its old forms as well, in terms of drama, theatre, film, etc. So all of those ideas, I think we need to now start discussing about where do we go forward. And they are, they're, I think, they're issues that should be debated in the leadership elections, of course. But actually, often the fray of leadership election is, is down to individual policy positions, etc. Maybe we can, in a calmer atmosphere, look at a longer term view about where we need to go. And the final point that I made in the, the article is um, no one ever told you it would be easy to achieve socialism. No one ever said it would be easy. And it is tough. And the range of forces against us who want to retain their control, the wealth and power, of course, will hang on to it for as long as possible. That's why we have to be firmer and more courageous and more determined and more creative than ever before. And I, I finished the article this morning by saying the one thing that we have on our side and is our smiles and our solidarity. Because actually, you need to start enjoying this struggle. You know, someone said to me, well, what how? I just said, look, it's a privilege to be on the pitch, isn't it? Rather than just in the stand. And we're all on the pitch playing this game to ensure that we succeed in the future. It's making sure that we play it effectively. So we decided what we'd do is we'd have a series of sort of workshop seminars like this. Um, to look at some individual topics of, of interest. And the first stage was to, yes, from some of the consideration of what happened in the election, listening to some of the debate that's gone on, and address some of those issues that were in the debate. And one of those issues that's been raised is this issue about, um, did we go too far on public ownership? Or was the nature of the public ownership that we are arguing for the right sort? Because I've read a couple of Guardian articles, and there was one today that accused us of statism, and I thought, my God, clearly I haven't read the policies. They haven't read the documents, and maybe that's our problem, we've never communicated them more effectively. But the issue around public ownership is absolutely critical. And again, what we need to do is ensure that we explain to people and understand ourselves what public ownership does in terms of democratizing our economy and shifting power and, yes, wealth into the hands of the many, not the few. The other issues we're going to deal with in the next session after this is around universal basic services. And what I find amazing in some of the debate that's happened so far is that these are referred to as freebies. Yeah, that is, they are free. That's the whole concept of universal basic services. And I, again, some people have been criticizing broadband because we wanted to develop it as a free service. 
Um, that came from a long debate within our trade union movement over time, and bizarrely enough, it was actually in some of the polling the most popular policy that we advocate during the general election, so I find it a bit bizarre that some are blaming it on the, the loss of the election because we offered free broadband. We're also then looking at the democratisation of our society. It's interesting some of the leadership candidates have taken that up over the last couple of days. And then we're looking at a hard-nosed look at what are we up against? What are the balance of forces within our society? And then finally, for this run of discussions, um, we are bringing together a, an expert team of just about how we communicate. How do we get our arguments across? How are we more effective in the development and use <coughs> of media and communication platforms? Because that's one of the key lessons that we need to learn. So the idea is to have um, four or five of these discussions and see where they go, and maybe at least they educate one another and raise the level of the debate, and maybe create a climate of opinion that could then permeate into wider discussions within our movement overall, okay? That's the idea. Uh, if you, anyone wants to leave at this stage, please do so if you're not here under false pretenses, okay? But tonight, we're gonna look at the issue around public ownership because it has been part of the discussion and, and the debate that's been happening since the election um, about its role. So we've invited along Cat Hobbs from We Own It, who some of you have heard speak before, but have been involved in the campaigns that Cat has launched as well. Again, I th think one of the organizations that has demonstrated just how you do popularize a particular policy. Then Dave Hall from Greenwich University is one of our policy experts that have been advising us on the detail of how you move away from this statish form of public ownership into one that is much more democratic and thriving and responsive. And then also Matt Lawrence from Commonwealth. Again, one of our policy experts, as some of you will know, has worked on this field as well and, and campaigned for it. There's a whole range, I just want to finally say this. In the discussions that we've had in recent years, one, I think one of the breakthroughs on the left in this last couple of years has been We've sort of new, we've established a new architecture of thought and campaigning, but in addition, particularly policy development. So the architecture of left think tanks now, I think, is extremely robust. The IPPR and the work that it did, um, class, New Economics Foundation, Autonomy, Commonwealth. Um, also, um, Patrick Allen is here as well, who helped found the Progressive Economics Forum economy forum. All of those now, I think, have established a really strong architecture of think tanks to develop our ideas on. <clears throat> but again, one of the key things is that they've linked themselves to the development of a social movement to make sure those ideas translate themselves into common discussions, popular discussions, that then translates itself into support for the policies as we go into future campaigns and elections. Anyway. That's enough for me. That's the reason for these, for these discussions over the next five weeks. By all means, come along. Uh, and if you've got other ideas, pitch them in, and we'll just help to generate some of that discussion, debate, and you never know, we might even break out into enthusiasm. I'm going to ban clapping as well. Uh, takes up too much time. Can we invite Cat Hobbs? I think. John. It's a privilege to be on the pitch with John McDonnell in any way, I think. Um, and he talked about how we have to be courageous and determined right now. And I think he needs a round of applause for just how courageous and determined he's been for moving the Overton window on public ownership in the last few years. ownership has always been popular. It was popular in the 80s when Thatcher was selling off all of our services, our water and energy. It was popular in the 90s when Blair was failing to renationalize the railways and in the noughties. It was popular in the 2010s when our Royal Mail and our NHS were being privatized and when councils were being pushed to outsource and being undermined with austerity. And it's now even more popular. So despite, as John mentioned, the colonization of our social media as a place where we can have these conversations, public ownership is now even more popular than it was in 2017. That's what the polling shows. And I think 
People have always had a hunch that running public services, the clues in the name, for the benefit of private shareholders doesn't make any sense. But what Labour did with their 2017 manifesto and their 2019 manifesto is they ended 30 years of unthinking ideology and opened up a whole new conversation that we could have in our communities, online, in debates, and that's why public ownership is now even more popular, despite the media, despite social media, and all of the vested interests who didn't want that to happen. Public ownership is popular with leavers and remainers. It's popular with old people and young people. It's popular with rich people and poor people, people all over the country, and people of all political parties, in fact. A majority of Tory voters want public ownership of most public services. And I think we need to remember in the election, the conversation that wasn't happening. No one really was defending privatization. They weren't defending the rip-off rail fares. They weren't defending the dirty rivers and beaches polluted by privatized water companies. They weren't defending the way that we run our energy grid, which is backward, which means that we don't get the renewable energy that we need, the new community projects that we need. They weren't defending care workers having 15-minute visits when they go to see old, vulnerable people and they don't have the time to do their job. They weren't defending head teachers of academy schools embezzling public funds or Richard Branson suing the NHS or G4S or Serco or the collapse or, or Carillion, which collapsed. They weren't defending any of that. The privatised industries, the vested interests, and the media weren't really saying anything on any of that at all. All they had was this untrue narrative about the cost of public ownership and how this somehow wasn't credible and it somehow wasn't affordable. And they used, they used every means they had to try and tell that story again and again and again. I think John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn, the way that they put forward these policies it was clear from the start, actually, if people had bothered to read the manifesto, that this wasn't about going back to the 70s. It was about going forward, and I think that was always clear. So we've now got some great thinking, we've got some great policies on the table. They are genuinely oven ready. You know, the kind of thing that David Hall has been doing, the kind of work that Matt Lawrence has been doing, that Max Harris has been doing, all of these people have been putting together ideas that can go into government. And I really hope that they will actually happen in the end. But if, sorry, I've lost my place. Um, and yeah, I wanted to mention our, our report as well, When We Own It, which is our um, outline of how public ownership should be. So we want to see citizens, communities, workers on boards. We want to see new, Public, um, public duties for public authorities which are running our services to make sure they're decarbonizing, to make sure they are stewarding our public land and assets, to make sure they're working closely with communities and providing the services that everyone needs. And we want an independent voice for public service users so that just as we have trade unions for workers, we have a voice for users as well. But if all these ideas are so great, and if public ownership is so popular, then why didn't people vote for it? Well, I think there's two very simple answers to that. The first is public ownership was popular, but it was outweighed by the popularity of Brexit in this context. It was a Brexit election. And to the extent that Brexit is about some idea of taking back control, of accountability over decision-making near to home, of sovereignty, many people are not going to be happy in a few years' time, when our vital services aren't run for our benefit, they're still being run for the benefit of very distant shareholders. The second thing is that public ownership is popular, but it was, as we've mentioned, outgunned. It was outgunned by the media, it was outgunned on social media. The decks were stacked against us. And that's not just about the never-ending attacks on Corbyn and McDonnell, it's about this line of argument that public ownership isn't affordable. So we worked hard, we worked with David Hall to get the story out there that actually public ownership 
is the only policy that makes sense for these services because we're wasting money right now, wasting money on shareholders, wasting money on fragmentation, wasting money on the higher cost of borrowing in the private sector. And we did get stories in the media. We got stories saying public ownership pays for itself. Public ownership would save us 13 billion pounds a year. But every day, I went into work and looked at the Google alerts for public ownership, privatization, nationalization, and there was a barrage of what can only be described as complete crap. And it was all of these stories about you know, how Corbyn wants to steal your grandma's cat, and it was all utter nonsense. And that's what we were up against. So maybe the framing could have been stronger, but that was the context that we were working in. We didn't have a chance. We have to tackle the way that media in this country is run, the way that social media in this country is run, if we're ever going to have a chance of having a real democracy and getting these policies on the agenda and winning. And I think we saw in that election, this is what it looks like when you try to challenge the establishment, when a political party actually puts forward what people actually want, which would take some power and give it to people, when you really put that on the table, this is how the establishment fights back. They knew from 2017 that Corbyn was a real threat, and they were going to use every means at their disposal to try and stop that from happening, and that's the truth of it. We have to do something about the Facebook algorithm in particular. So we saw at We Own It that the kind of traction we were getting in 2017 was huge. It was huge organic traction. The kind of traction we were getting in 2019 was not comparable in the least, and that's the same across lots of left-wing media. It's completely unfair, and it means that not only Labour, not only Momentum, but a whole infrastructure of groups which are trying to make the case for these ideas are being outgunned systematically, and they don't have the resources to make the case. And we know, of course, that the Tories spent way, way more than Labour on Facebook ads. And the day after the election, sorry, I'm being a bit gloomy here, I will get more positive. The day after the election, the stocks and shares of those companies, of the, you know, the establishment, the utility companies, leapt up. Right, that's it, folks. We've won. No problem. Threat over. So we have to tackle this. Otherwise, we won't have a democracy, let alone the Labour Party in government. So what do we do now? First of all, we have to keep public ownership on the agenda. There's this consensus building right now that, of course, it makes sense for the railway to be in public ownership. So all of the Labour leadership candidates are happy to say, yes, rail in public ownership, of course. They're a little bit more uh, ambiguous about the other public services. And we've seen that Grant Shapps is planning to bring the Northern franchise into public ownership, which is really great news. But it's absolutely illogical to argue that the railway should be in public ownership and other public services shouldn't. If you think that the railway is a natural monopoly, then exactly the same arguments apply to our energy grid, to our water network, as apply to the railway. If you think that you know, the railway is a network, so it makes sense to have cross-subsidy so that everyone can have a service, then exactly the same arguments apply to buses, the Royal Mail, broadband, as apply to the railway. If you think our money should be going towards investing in services rather than shareholders, then you know, we need to get our NHS back in fully public hands and our justice system. And if you think that passengers should have some kind of accountability over the service they get on the railway, then why wouldn't you want our schools to be locally, democratically accountable instead of being run by unaccountable academies? Why would you want council services to be outsourced with no accountability over them? So we're doing a couple of things. We are asking all Labour leadership candidates and deputies to pledge to show which of the public ownership policies in Labour's manifesto they will support. And we want to be very clear about that. And where we want to get to is that they all feel that they have to sign up. So please look out for actions around that, because we have to shift things, and we have to shift things now. We do not want a new Labour leader who drops this agenda. That would be a disaster. And we also need a Labour leader who has an actual vision around this. So, you know, this stuff makes people's lives better. If we have strong hospitals and schools, if we have public transport that is a real alternative to driving and flying, 
if we have water companies and energy companies that are looking after our environment and tackling the climate emergency and creating good jobs. The other thing that we're doing is we want to find out a bit more about why people support public ownership. We know that they do. We want to know why. We, we have an idea from our supporters of the kinds of arguments that resonate with people, but now is the time to dig into that and make sure that we have our messaging as strong as possible. The next election is not going to be about Brexit. So we have to do everything in our power. Thank God. <laughs> people wiping a brow in the audience. Yeah. It's not going to be about Brexit. We have to make sure that it's about public ownership and strong public services that work for everyone. The second thing we need to do is we need to keep winning, partly to keep our spirits up. So We Own It has won a number of victories, including helping to stop privatisation of NHS professionals, helping to stop privatisation of the land registry, campaigning to bring the East Coast Line into public hands, and campaigning to bring probation contracts into public hands. And we want to keep doing that. So we're working in Greater Manchester with the Better Buses for Greater Manchester campaign to get our buses under public control up there. And that's a victory that could be copied all around the country. We want Grant Shapps not just to bring Northern into public ownership, but to bring the whole railway into public ownership. And that would be a great basis to argue for public ownership in the future. We need to stand up for our NHS every step of the way. We did get traction with the stories about how people don't actually trust Johnson on the NHS. They are worried about it. And we need to make sure he can't wriggle out of his promise to keep the NHS off the table in any trade deals. And we need to inflict some serious damage if he tries to do that. We shouldn't give up on the climate for five years. We can't afford to do that. And I think there's an exciting potential campaign that we could run around wind turbines. So Boris Johnson has committed to quadruple offshore wind capacity. It makes a lot more sense to do that with publicly owned wind turbines. And he might even think it's a fantastic idea that he could get behind. You just never know. A great British company delivering, delivering jobs, delivering renewable energy. We need to stand up for our democracy. And we need to move towards a media that we all own. And so what we're going to be doing at We Own It is starting to try to build an alliance around defending the BBC. As you'll be aware, Dominic Cummings is, a, is attacking the BBC, and we know that he sees it as a mortal enemy of the Tory party. We don't want to end up, like America, with just Fox News to defend us. So we're going to be campaigning for a people's charter for the BBC and trying to build a broad alliance around that so that we can make sure we've actually got a reformed BBC that is publicly accountable, that doesn't do what it did during the election, that defends our interests, that stands up for truth, and that actually works for this country. But we can't give up on it. We can't just say, oh, we're annoyed at the BBC, so we're going to give up on all the great stuff it does. So that's, that's our next big campaign. Our public services have been stolen from us. And if this is a people's government, then we should be fighting as the people to take them back. I think we can tap into Brexit, but we need to tap into it with a broad we that includes immigrants, that includes marginalized groups, that includes all of us, because that's the kind of country that we want to be. But there are lots and lots of people in this country who really want strong public services, who think that public services are valuable, who think that they're about caring for each other. And we need to make sure those people are with us. Whatever the internal conversations happening within Labour right now, public services aren't going to get any less important. They're not going to go out of style. And we absolutely need to bring everyone with us in defending them. Let's fight for our public services. Let's fight to keep the Overton window open, to use a different metaphor. Let's fight to keep things where they are with the debate. And let's take back what we have in five years, I hope, with a new government. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Now, Dave Hall has been one of our expert advisors throughout from Greenwich University. Dave. Thanks very much. Is the PowerPoint up there? Yeah. Is there a changer I can use? Max is doing it over there. If oh. You just give them a... 
Oh, okay. Okay. My better assistant. Okay, terrific. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I, just to repeat uh, Kat's uh, applause for uh, John's role in uh, inspiring the whole development of policies in this area in a way that just hasn't happened for decades. And just to add to it, appreciation of Kat's role in that as well. Um, and that if, uh, to pick up on a couple of her metaphors, the Overton window has been forced wide open and shifted by both of them together, which will enable us to start fully baking those oven ready policies uh, with a good draft coming through or some, something, something like that anyway. Um, Okay, uh, in a real sense, a lot of what I'm going to do is can be considered a kind of technical annex to Kat's presentation, which, uh, which uh, is hopefully a helpful role in life. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the reasons for public ownership uh, being good uh, policy, uh, then about the actual evidence for the reasons for voting, uh, people not voting Labour, uh, at the elections, then to look at the evidence on public support for public ownership policies, and finally to offer a few conclusions. So firstly, on the next slide, the uh, issue of why uh, should we, do we argue for public ownership and operation uh, of the sectors? Uh, if you listen to most media presentations, it's treated as a kind of issue of religious belief, uh, that there are some people who actually believe in public ownership because they're Marxists or Corbynistas, uh, whereas the rest uh, don't believe in that religion and so don't believe in public ownership, and that's all it's about. Um, uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think it's true in any of the policies that have been developed, and I don't think, I think we should force ourselves to think away from it, uh, despite the fact that we are politically committed, as it were, to these policies, to recognise that underlying these policies is some quite material set of objectives and a quite material set of reasons why public ownership is a better way of achieving those objectives. So behind everything here, there's a series of objectives trying to achieve what are sometimes called public goods, of which the most uh, current uh, new one is uh, dealing with climate change, but there's long-standing historic public goods like public health, uh, full employment, uh, and uh, uh, so on, that, and economic development that have been core parts, uh, core objectives behind uh, public services and public sector structures. And so the question as to why we have argued for public ownership, I think, should be considered in terms of what the advantages of public ownership are in delivering those objectives. Uh, and I put up here four or five that I think uh, are key and recur. Um, one is simple universality. Uh, when the market does things, when commercial operations do things, they select the areas that are most profitable and they don't do it elsewhere. Uh, you can see that on a global scale, you can see it on a local scale. Uh, and you can see it in negative terms even after privatisation of the water services, one of the first things some of the water companies did was to try and disconnect people who weren't paying their water bills because they couldn't afford to. Uh, it's a way of neg uh, form negative selectivity. So universality is one big advantage of uh, public ownership. Secondly, control of prices. Uh, it's a way of protecting people against monopoly pricing or oligopoly pricing uh, in the case of uh, the energy sector, for example. Um, and the public sector brings with it in that the extra advantage of a lower cost of capital. We have a lower interest rate for our borrowing and so there are serious cost advantages. All of this brings costs down, prices down to people. And as we'll see in a minute, that's quite important to hang on to. Thirdly, there's efficiencies and flexibilities. Bit of a surprise maybe, people don't normally talk about the efficiencies and flexibilities in public ownership, uh, but they're huge to do with coordination and the elimination of what economists call transaction costs. If you don't have lots of people to try and incentivize to do what you want to do, even though they want to do something else, uh, it's more straightforward. Um, and that uh, was actually one of the core arguments for the creation of the NHS, um, quite apart from the principle of free healthcare, healthcare free at the point of need. Uh, the creation of a public ser service 
uh, was argued on the basis of being far more efficient than a coalesce coalescence of private and voluntary operators. Then you have employment, that through a public sector presence, you can develop trained workforce, decent pay and conditions of employment, which can resonate throughout the economy. And finally, of course, the advantages, simple advantages of democracy, <coughs> accountability, transparency, etc. So, okay, that's a bit of a plod through slightly abstract concepts, uh, but I'll come back to them in a minute and I hope to show they're somewhat relevant for us to hang on to. These are the reasons for public ownership. The next slide. Uh, reinforces the fact that it's non-religion because one thing that uh, discovered when uh, the broadband policy was being developed was that actually uh, these arguments for public ownership of broadband and bringing it to the uh, everybody's door had been used before. They were used in the 19th century by the Tories when uh, the Israeli government nationalised the telegraph. Uh, why? Because the private sector was too slow and selective in extending it. They were used by the Liberal government in 2011 uh, for nationalising the telephones. Why? Because the private sector was too slow and selective in developing it. And bang, there was a, we've had a lost opportunity of a wonderful historical hat-trick of a 21st century Labour government uh, nationalising broadband for exactly the same reasons. Huh? Uh, so, um, it... Um, uh, it not only predates, uh, uh, predates us, it predates the Labour Party. Those things were before the Labour Party even existed. Uh, so this isn't religion, this is uh, good uh, political and social and economic sense. Uh, and that's why there's still fragments of it in the Tory manifesto, uh, including uh, a readiness for public ownership in the rail sector. Okay, so moving on from that framework, what's the evidence about the factors influencing voters to not vote Labour? Uh, first survey that was carried out by um, opinion on the day, and as Kat has said, the message is clear, the figures are clear. On the left-hand column, you'll see 37% said leadership, 21% Brexit, only 6% said economic policies. Even if economic policies meant <coughs> entirely the public ownership policies, it was clearly only a very minor issue. Interestingly, Conservative voters who switched, there were quite a lot of Tories who voted Conservative in 2017 and didn't this time round, gave the same two factors as reasons for their switching. They didn't like their leadership and they didn't like the Brexit policies, so they switched, mainly to Lib Dems, unfortunately, uh, but just to reinforce the message, I think, that this was clearly a Brexit election, not uh, about the other stuff. The next slide shows the results of another survey also carried out on the day, asking people a slightly wider and more open question of all voters, what were the main issues for you in deciding how to vote in this election? And you can see there on the top line, again, Brexit or Remain, one way or the other, was overwhelmingly the big issue for everybody. So, as Kat says, whatever, whatever happens with the next election, that's not going to be the issue. So we strike out the top line. Uh, the next one, as you can see, extraordinarily, is the NHS, to which the... Uh, one's tempted to say, why didn't it make any difference to how they voted? But the NHS then becomes the top issue. But then I want to draw attention to the next four ones that are green, shaded green there. Firstly, economy and jobs. Secondly, climate change. Next but one, prices. And next but one, poverty and equality. And the reason I want to draw your attention to those is that these are substantially important issues. OK, 13, 14, 15, 20 percent, that's substantially important issues. And I want to refer back to the point about what's the reasons for public ownership. Take prices and cost of living, for example. If public ownership of water, energy grids, post, etc., enables us to reduce prices, that is a significant gain. It's one of the significant reasons for public ownership in the sector. Not only that, it's significantly important to people. I was once told uh, by a journalist who was on um, BBC Breakfast Television that every time they covered water or energy, they got three times as much uh, uh, um, audience response as they did on any other issues. Why? Because they're hugely important to the cost of living. So, we're not talking abstract issues of are you in favour of public ownership or not, 
its concrete issues of are you in favour of lower energy rail water prices or not. And the same with economy and jobs. Uh, the package that was put together around <coughs> the Green New Deal uh, in the Labour manifesto was an extraordinary example of something that was effectively a regional redevelopment policy for revitalising at regional and local level all the economies at the same time as delivering climate change, which is also up there as a big priority. Look across the column of what Lib Dem voters uh, regard as their priorities. After Brexit, I think actually, after Brexit and the NHS, 30% of Lib Dems say <coughs> climate change was a big uh, electoral uh, voting issue. So. Uh, the evidence from this, I think, is that once we strike out that top line of Brexit, all the issues that the public ownership uh, policies are focused on delivering are next in line. These are waiting to become uh, the big issues uh, of the next election. OK, so that, so much for how people actually voted. What on the question of public ownership? Um, many of you m might probably have seen the, this data or the, these graphs before, but if you want to be cheered up, then I'm going to spend 10 minutes making you all a bit more happy um, because uh, we might not have won the election, but we certainly won hearts and minds and uh, shifted the Overton window and the uh, public consensus. That's a YouGov poll on the day of the election, simply asking the question, are you in favour of public ownership or private ownership in these sectors, uh, post, railways, water, buses, energy, telecoms? And you'll see in every single one except telecoms, where it was treated as the whole telecom sector, there's not only majority public support, it's huge public support. These are not down uh, majorities. This is not marginally, maybe convinced, maybe not. This is big. This is convince, uh, conviction. Uh, the next slide uh, shows uh, another opinion poll. It's going out four weeks after the election, maybe after Christmas on reflection. People might regret ever having thought they were a good idea. No, they're still saying by like, two to one, three to one, yes, we think public ownership in these sectors is a good idea. I mean, Captain John has uh, both, both said that, but I mean, it's really. Uh, firm, strong, powerful stuff. Anyone would be grateful for that level of support uh, of any kind of policies. And the next slide shows what Kat's already referred to, which is that YouGov poll compared what people had said in 2017 with what they said in 2019. And the support during the current Labour Party leadership has grown steadily over those two and a half years. An extra 9% of people have shifted in favour of public ownership during those two and a half years. This is not a static, remnant, old uh, nostalgia for um, the old days working here. This is a vital, moving, shifting, developing thing. OK, and the next slide, I think it's even better. Again, Kat said, uh, has, has said it, really. But I mean, the, the sub-analysis of these results shows astonishing uniformity. This was one of the most divisive elections uh, in living memory, divided by age, crucial differences, by region, by city and urban areas, um, and obviously by Brexit. But when it comes to support for public ownership, that is astonishingly uniform. Just look at the figures in the top line on each one. That's across age groups, it's across gender, it's across uh, education, it's across income, it's across ethnicity, uh, it's across region. And joyously, if you look at Brexit, it's a common position of people who supported both Brexit and Remain. That, I mean, that makes this an astonishingly remarkable, very quite unusually unifying uh, policy, huh? which I think is something uh, really to uh, hang on to. And the next one, uh, as Kat said, um, again, this is the data on the support across parties. If you look at the left-hand two sets, that's the Tory voters, the left-hand bundle of columns is the people in favour of public ownership of those sectors. The right-hand bundle is people against it. Uh, and what you'll see there is it's close, but actually in all four of those sectors, the Tory voters, by majority, are in favour of public ownership. And that's just the Tories. 
you look over to the right and you look at Lib Dem voters, people who actually voted Lib Dem. Uh, that's two to one, they're supporting public ownership. And, and this is especially relevant, I think, for the internal leadership debate, you look at the middle column of Labour voters, uh, you don't see any doubt there. There's not a single sector where there's even double figures who are opposed to public ownership. It would really be quite extraordinary if a party whose supporters uh, support public ownership by such huge majorities starts thinking it should, for some reason, abandon these policies or reduce them. So, OK, so the next one. The only fly in the ointment of these results was that the BMG survey asked the question, would you support these Corbyn's policies on nationalisation, exploring the idea that uh, the Corbyn brand was toxic, and indeed they got different results, but I don't think they're seriously um, uh, confusing the position. Uh, a lot of people would don't know. A lot of people who obviously weren't Labour supporters didn't know what it was to do with them. And if you look at Labour voters' response, it's actually very clear. Labour voters say, by two and a half to one, yeah, we think we should stick with the policies of the Corbyn McDonald team which is great and encouraging, uh, and what they should do. So finally, just offering some conclusions, a uh, simple reiteration of the obvious conclusions. No evidence that public ownership fat policies are factors turning voters against Labour. Strong evidence that they're really popular with all voters, and so they should make the party more electable, more electable. Uh, there is evidence of issues of presentation, uh, issues of cost to be dealt with, but we shouldn't get carried away with uh, that. That kind of uh, review of tactics and strategy is always uh, appropriate, but it doesn't mean the policies uh, are wrong. Uh, as Kat said, we may actually see some public ownership from the Tories in the near future. Um, one suggestion that I've got in terms of reframing is as I think most of these policies, the green economy most obviously, can be built up into sort of economic regional development policies that bring with them all those other objectives uh, of uh, green, uh, green economy and so on. Uh, and finally, just politics continue. Uh, so we carry on doing this stuff locally and nationally knowing uh, that so many people support us. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, what I find galling is that Tories are going to nationalise more railways than me. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Lawrence, come on. Thanks. Max, might stand up so I can flag you for that. Uh, well, thanks very much. I'm Matthew Lawrence from Commonwealth, which was a new organisation that launched in April of last year, uh, looking at ownership models for a democratic and sustainable economy. And there's really no way that Commonwealth would exist in some ways without the work sort of the courage, the political imagination of Kat, Dave and colleagues, but of course John and his team. So it's a real sort of pleasure to be here, which I think is a really useful series. So I guess the exam question is, you know, as it's been attested, the ideas of public ownership, but also democratic ownership more broadly about giving people a genuine stake and a say in the economy, genuine democratic power, popular, necessary in the face of economic, political, and social crisis, and yet roundly defeated. And I think it's important to caveat that you know, the defeat was not necessarily around the ideas of public ownership per se, but I think when we're talking about democratic ownership, public ownership, we don't want it just to be not a net negative, we want it to be a sort of huge sort of weapon in the sort of quest to build a democratic economy as a whole. So I think we need to be slightly wary of false constellations that say individual pop policies were popular, Actually, it's about the, sort of the narrative, it's the, how they aggregate together, it's about the story they tell, it's about how we can make these credible and believable. So what I want to do in the next 10 minutes or so is try and draw out some lessons uh, from the most transformative, effective political project to transform ownership in this country, to sort of radically reshape property relations, and that is, of course, Thatcherism. And I think we sort of still sometimes quite forget quite how radical a break Thatcherism was. And I think in looking at that, we can then learn lessons, not for some nostalgic look backwards, but how into the 2020s, a project of transformative ownership can win again. 
And I think just as you know, a couple of examples of how sort of radical it was. So between 1979 and 1996, in the OECD countries, which are some of the sort of wealthiest countries in the world, the total value of privatization of all those countries, the UK was responsible for almost half of it. Almost half all privatizations occurred in the UK. So the UK is a complete outlier in regards to the scale to which the political project of Thatcherism, both Margaret Thatcher but obviously John Major, succeeded in transforming property relations. And the scale of it was, you know, we'll go through why, but another point is Nigel Lawson, when he went to the city to try and privatize BT, which was then the largest ever flotation in the world, he was told by the city, this is simply not possible. It's simply implausible. There's not enough capital to soak this up. It's just not, it's not possible. And they sort of said, no, that's not good enough. We're going to come back and have a plan. So I think there's sort of the scale of it suggests we have to learn from it. So there's five lessons I want to draw out. So that's a narrative of renewal and purpose that obviously has to be radically different for those focused on democratic ownership, but I want to sort of tee, tee up that. Prefigured and phalanx, which I'll, I'll go through in a second, it's mainly alliteration between the prefigured and the phalanx. Phalanx is not the ideal word there. Outriding would do. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was struggling a bit there. The strategic ordering of the agenda, which I think, you know, is sort of an interesting one to tease out. The unequal, if real material benefits to a sort of select, uh, narrow constituency that sort of privatization de delivered, but sort of it was powerful in that sense. And how that combination, that new political economy, was able to construct a sort of fairly hegemonic um, political coalition for this sort of new right in that period and sort of transform the country. So the first one was a narrative of renewal and purpose. And I think there's a number of things here for lessons for public ownership agenda and democratic ownership going forwards. So the new right managed to combine a sort of moral appeal, sort of, you know, neo-Victorian thrift, a sort of Grantham shopkeeper's sort of, you know, bookkeeping skill with a sense of what Stuart Hall called regressive modernization, a project that was about fixing the failure of Callaghan and the obvious crisis of social democracy. And of course, the left had an alternative economic strategy, but the new right, that political strategy won out. And I think the sense that actually the ownership agenda of the right whatever its effects, was presented both as sort of a moral mission, but also a sort of modernizing mission is a sort of thing. It wasn't presented necessarily always as nostalgic. It's something to look towards. And I think, you know, it, it was able to present something that was both extremely radical as common sense, but also make the common sense very radical. So that, this is uh, Milton Friedman at a, a drinks reception, which looks, looks delightful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, so prefigured and phalanx. So there's two things I think that public ownership uh, advocates and sort of, you know, sort of those arguing for it in the years ahead can learn from, which is one in terms of prefiguration. So I think we sometimes forget that many of the sort of totemic policies of what constitutes sort of Thatcherism did not actually sort of arrive in a sort of think tank report in the 1980s, but actually were prefigured in local government in the 1970s. So most famously, right to buy was trialed in the borough of Wandsworth. And I think the lessons there is about sort of proof of concept of being able to point to something that, frankly, you know, and I work in a think tank, but isn't just a think tank report, but you can say this works down the road. Whatever its consequences, that you could say this works. So I think that prefiguration is important. And clearly what Thatcherism also did was sort of this outright in this phalanx of public intellectuals, of public academics, of think tanks of the IEA, the Adam Smith Institute, et cetera, et cetera, that really contested as a sort of coordinated ecology a sort of movement towards neoliberalism and a sort of specific political agenda. So I think that's sort of sense that democratic ownership agenda has to cohere and coordinate much more effectively is a lesson we could learn. So this, this is John Major. Uh, the, the, I think it's the day he became prime minister, potentially. And I think I was struggling a little bit here, but the strategic ordering of the agenda, I think by what I mean is that when we look at sort of the 18 years of conservative rule, we tend to sort of package it all up as one. But actually, of course, if you look at 1979, the privatization agendas were quite small. There was right to buy and there's a couple of other smaller sectors. The bigger sort of sectoral ones around BT, et cetera, were in the mid to the late 80s. And then railway, which is, you can kind of see a railway behind on the back screen. Railway was not until 1993, and obviously we're living with disastrous consequences of that still. But I think the key sense is there is that not, you know, not only in sort of minor strike and the building up of power there, they didn't sort of, you know, make the mistake of Heath, but they ordered and built up to a series of privatizations. It wasn't a big bang. And there are potentially you know, difficult lessons, I guess, for sort of the Labour in particular to think about what are the strategic orderings, or at least how the, how's the narrative told there. The fourth is, um, this is a campaign for uh, FUC Sid Tellhim, which is for the uh, 
say, privatization of British gas and the advert for the, uh, for the shares on the 25th of November. Um, and it was unequal if real material benefits. So I think um, you know, there's a line that flew around Twitter a while ago um, around sort of, sort of you know, what was it? Sort of neoliberalism runs out of steam when it runs out of public things to privatize or something. I've completely garbled it. But the essential point is, at the early stage of privatization, unlike, for example, you know, sort of 2010 government, there were th still things, there were public forms, public assets, public institutions, public wealth to be privatized. And I think paradoxically, and this is a point someone like David Edgerton makes, you know, the very success of privatization as a political project depended on the very success of public ownership. Because it's the public sector that created the wealth to be privatized in the first place. And so it, it tests the ability to build up public wealth that enabled this. But nonetheless, in privatization, there was real material benefits that people got. And that, that sort of exhausted itself as privatization sort of ran out of steam. But there were genuine material benefits as well as real shifts in power. Um, yeah. And this is the Patterson family. This is the first family to get a right to buy a house under some national legislation rather than Wandsworth. And what this sort of political sort of configuration was able to do was to pull into the conservative sort of column through ownership policies, not just ownership policies, but through ownership policies, a new and very powerful political coalition that we managed to cohere and which in some ways it's kind of been reconstituted today. And so I think this sense of using ownership not just as a way to fix the very real problems that David said about the actual economic benefits of public ownership, but as a political tool to build a new political constituency. So then I just want to, um, so then so I want to apply this to two areas that were sort of actually been touched on already, which is the Green New Deal, which is a framing that potentially doesn't, you know, I think it's an interesting frame to debate, but I think the core principle of that, of a public effort, public-led effort to transform our communities, our society, and build sort of a post-carbon society of affluence, of luxury, of power through public ownership, through public investment, through transforming the rules of the game is fundamental and should be fundamental to any offer going forwards. And I think in some ways, rather than sort of discrete offers around public ownership, wrapping it up in this, this frame could be a sort of way forward. So it could be, rather than talking about you know, public ownership of land and land for the many as a sort of a really interesting way to definancialize the economy or whatever it might be, we can talk about public ownership of land is the only way to secure just transition in rural economies and decarbonize sort of, you know, farming land. We could talk about public housing as a way of building out luxurious post-carbon sort of decarbonized housing stock and sort of wrap it all up in that municipal bus ownership, not just as a sort of discrete project to reduce fares, but as a sort of moral and national mission of renewal of you know, the left building out a post-carbon affluent society. And again, with the like, Green New Deal, one of the advantages of it is that you can prefigure that. You know, every local authority, every Labour sort of mayor, every, you know, the Welsh government should be prefiguring this with local Green New Deal so that in four or five years' time, the Labour Party can point to radical, credible, but replicable, tested examples of public ownership that combine with this national sort of story of building post-carbon affluence. And then the other um, one to point to was the inclusive ownership funds, which is a little bit of a cheat because it's something that Commonwealth has been working on. It's not quite in the sort of traditional public ownership um, sort of sphere, but it's certainly around how do you transfer fundamentally wealth and power in the economy. And again, there's lessons that you can kind of draw back from Thatcherism, albeit in a very different direction, which is about giving people, millions of people, a genuine stake and a say in the economy. And this is this idea of all large companies over time building out a state controlled by and for their workforce and they would share in the profits and have voice in their company. So the Inclusive Ownership Fund is a way of giving people a genuine stake, and it's about that story of a sort of majoritarian coalition being built by reshaping corporate power and giving ordinary people a say. So it's not about sort of an academic institution, it's about genuine power in places where people work, where solidarities, solidarities can be built. And in terms of this sort of making the radical seem reasonable, it's another example of how this policy can be portrayed as a very radical in institution, and in many ways it is, but at the same time, it repurposes existing mechanisms. So for example, the mechanism itself is companies would be required to issue shares to this worker-controlled fund, and over time that would accumulate more profit share for workers, more voting rights. Now that might seem radical to the city, but under existing investor guidelines, public companies are allowed to give up to 10% of their shares over a decade to their workforce. And we've done some analysis coming out later this year, but sort of we looked at the last year alone, executives in FTSE 100 companies, through share issuance, held up to £28 billion of the shares. So you can kind of say, 
what well, is really radical, or you could say that this is simply repurposing and building democratic companies where people have a genuine stake and a say in what they do. And then, you know, sort of began in the sort of struggle of the 1970s and 80s, and so obviously a sort of iconic uh, figure uh, in some ways, um, well, not in some ways, was iconic. Uh, so the future belongs to those who hear it coming. And I guess that kind of um, wraps it up in some ways in the sense that, like, of course, you know, nostalgia and a sense of solidarity and sort of a heritage and past matters to the public ownership agenda, how it's framed, how it's positioned. But I think, as, you know, as Dave's as attested to, as Kat's attested to, it's also about modernity. It's about the sort of challenges we're facing. It's about the foundational sort of roots of our prosperity going forwards. So it's about you know, public ownership of buses and rails, et cetera. But it's also about what, is, what are the commanding heights of the 21st century economy of data, of IP, of natural resources in the age of climate crisis. It's about rethinking you know, ownership of the algorithms, of cloud computing. So I think public ownership has to be sort of alive to the possibility of moving into new sectors, new domains, but keeping that sense of being democratic, being decentralized, and being about the future and building a future that works for all of us. I bet you've never been to a Labour event where the final words were David Bowie. <laughs> OK, should we open up to questions and comments? Um, uh, if people are going to make a comment, can they do it with under two minutes? Is that all right, that we can fit more people in? Because I know what we're all like. Do you want to come in? I'll try and be very quick, but um, it's, it's a bit of a wide uh, thing. It's about the NHS, and it's about how we, we started off with Jeremy's position as renationalizing the NHS, uh, which was adopted as labor policy, but it soon turned into a funding issue. And that list that we saw, the YouGov poll and Labour's presentation was, we're going to renationalize rail, gas. I was listening out for the big one, which should have been the number one thing. And, and we had the basis for that. And we, it has all the, it's built on illegitimacy, what they've done to the NHS. And as Jeremy Gilbert wrote the other day, it's, it's, it tells a story of 40 years of neoliberalism in a way that we can, we can understand. And quickly about the, the, the theme of the evening, it's Sam Tarry said the other day about broadband, that it, we shouldn't have been talking about it being free so much as people getting any at all if they were in certain parts of, of the country where they would otherwise not get it. Because the state can do that, private companies can't. It's the same for rail, it's the same for post, and it's the same for the NHS because it's the more corporations have been involved as they, they write the policies at the moment. They write Simon Stevens' policies, they write the policies that are not being discussed that Diane Abbott did bring up for a while, sustainability transformation plans, and then disappeared from the uh, conversation. So. The more they've been involved, the more it's local services, the GPs and the local A&E hospitals that have been under attack. I'm saying it's a shame because it happened under Tony Blair and uh, Jeremy Corbyn stood up and, and argued against it, the Darcy polyclinics, the closures of the local services. When the same policies came up under the pretext of austerity, it's as if it's not happening. It's just because of underfunding. It's not because of underfunding. Underfunding is a means to do it. But these are the same policies with the same people working with the Tories in Kwangos and kept out of the way, but you know, invisibilized by this underfunding narrative. So at the moment, what's happening is all these policies that haven't happened since about 2014, they're, they're going to be enshrined in law. So that's closures of hospitals across the country. 40 new hospitals means three or four closures and downgrades in each of the 44 areas. That's roughly what, what that's about. And we, and we need to be opposing that. Even if it's going to pass, they've got a majority. We need to say why it's wrong, the closures, the getting rid of skilled staff, replacing it with unskilled staff, the stuff that Bob Gill here talks about in his film, and the stuff that Labour conference has voted three years in a row to oppose. We need to hear that. We need to hear articulate MPs talking about why that's wrong. I had a conversation with Sam Tarry because actually the main thrust of our policy was making sure of access to broadband, rolling it out in the least connected areas, and also ensuring it actually been toured around for 18 months in every other Saturday doing economic conferences in towns. And that was one of the main themes that came out of that discussion, but it was also about the economic benefits of broadband for those particular areas that could help that. Um, I have two very quick ones. Oh, 
Sorry. <laughs> I have two very quick ones. One uh, is that I completely agree that nobody thinks privatization is popular. Where I'm struggling is persuading them that nationalization is the answer. And too many people think it's going to be too expensive. And one of the things is, yes, interest rates are really low right now. But the more we borrow, uh, the more the interest rates are going to go up. And I just would love to get better at persuading people <laughs> in case we have an election early. And my second point, and I'm going to make myself unpopular, and I'm really sorry, but the word democracy comes up a lot. I'm about to resign from the movement that I volunteered for for four years because I don't feel like it's being remotely democratically run. And one of the examples is we were given absolutely no choice who we could vote for um, for the leadership election. I think just being given an answer is not democracy. And, but that's just one example of many examples of why I'm leaving the movement and sadly leaving the movement is because I don't feel like there's anything democratic about it. That's it. Okay. We'll persuade you otherwise. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, Ewan McGahey, King's College London. I teach labor law and uh, enterprise law um, at the law school. Uh, thanks for four great talks. Um, uh, they're all exceptionally uh, interesting. I've got lots of notes. Uh, I've got a comment and a question. Um, the comment is that I think that focusing on outcomes over process works in winning. Uh, so to just give you a, a simple example, in 2013, Switzerland had a referendum against stopping rip-off executive pay. Um, and it was the second ever highest result in favor of a referendum that there'd ever been. Uh, the actual content of the law uh, that they were voting for was about putting a duty on pension funds to vote for uh, who would be on the board of, um, of, of directors of companies and banning banks from taking shareholder voting rights. Uh, but you, you try to explain a lot of that on the doorstep, you're going to get eyes glazing over. And what one was they said, we're going to stop, rip off executive pay. And that, that's the outcome, because if you democratize the way that the corporation works, you, uh, you uh, will, will, will get that result. And so I think you know, one of the things that uh, you could have, um, well, well, one of the ways that you can sell nationalization is it's going to cut your bills. You know, no, three, three words, uh, just like get Brexit done, cut your bills. And of course, that's what the Conservatives did incredibly effectively. 50,000 new nurses, 20,000 police officers, everyone remembers it. Uh, the, com the comment, uh, uh, that's the comment. The question is, um, uh, Matt, you mentioned uh, Wandsworth as the sort of uh, prototype of the right to buy. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful idea, you know, that local councils, local uh, government can be the, like the laboratories of democracy. And so since we're out of power for the next five years, uh, I'd like to ask everybody, what do you think local labor councils, uh, the London government, um, and, and other governments like Manchester or perhaps Wales could do uh, to advance the public ownership agenda. Thanks. Um, hello, thank you for all of your talks. Um, with the sort of death of defined benefit pensions and the fact that we're all now, um, or most of us, in defined contribution pensions uh, accelerated by auto-enrollment. A lot of us are, uh, most of us, are shareholders um, through our pensions in the companies that um, it's proposed are, are renationalized. I was wondering what the plan is um, for, um, you know, bearing in mind we, we're in an aging population, what the plan is to um, if there's renationalization to sort of pay those shareholders who have those companies in their pension funds um, and where they sort of should either be compensated or, or invested somewhere else. Hi. Um, sorry, I haven't quite figured this question out yet, but I hope it will come out right. Um, so you mentioned uh, the media and kind of the fight that we have against that, and I don't know that that's going to go away while the media as it stands in the country is in... It, overwhelmingly capitalist owned. Um, back uh, before the sun became the sun, it was, I think, is the Herald um, or the record, one of those, um, and a quarter of its shares were owned by the TUC. Um, are there um, mechanisms and even capital in our movement to build our own our own media, not, and like more than our just kind of independent leftist blogs, um, and sort of 
that are, could potentially be like a tabloid for the left. Um, and following on from that, where if we, you know, I, I'm kind of I'm a really big believer in small and hyper-local projects and hyper-local victories. Um, and I think that could be one of the places we could build on for, you know, for, for the next five years. Um, but if we're looking for these like really local projects, like on the housing estate I live on, all those sorts of things, where are we going to find the capital to start winning? Um, you know, we, I live on an incre incredibly deprived estate. We have no money. We have no anything really. But you know, there are things that we could be doing to make our, the place that we live uh, healthier, better, and nicer for everyone. But there's, we don't have the capital there. So, I mean, where do you think that that capital could come from to make these little ones? I'd like to take up this idea of a prototype um, of, of services. I think one very good example is that there are some local authorities who are taking <laughs> services back in-house. So sometimes it's care, uh, home care services, um, waste management services, and street cleaning, for instance. And there are a number of local authorities that have done that over the last few years. They've got the experience. They've found they have, for instance, with home care services, the, there's a much lower turnover of staff. Quality of services actually improves. So we have those examples, and I think we need to make those much more widely understood and known. Thank you. Um, mine is a question. Um, the context I give is specifically about Royal Mail, but I'm sure it's transfer transferable to other public services too. Um, when Royal Mail was prioritised in 2013, the context of the country was a very different situation. Uh, since then, we continue to see the decline of letters and the rise of online shopping. And um, with the likes of Amazon, who are able to offer um, their own logistics services. Um, there's a rise in demand, for example, for next day delivery. And I imagine that demand will keep increasing. So with that in mind, the privatized version of Royal Mail today is, try I believe, is trying to make changes that contribute to the dispute with unions. So. With that in mind, um, my question is about what is the role of a nationalised Royal Mail in that context? And that can be transferable to other public services you see changing um, society too. Yes. Hi, um, it seems to me that quite often that um, it's not so much that people are against um, nationalization, but that they maybe don't trust the state to be able to kind of, uh, whatever, manage things properly. And the question is, how are you going to convince people that you know, the state at the end of the day is actually capable of you know, creating good and solid projects, managing them well, et cetera? I think that's really important. Thank you. Um, I would just, um, I propose some caution around relying too much on the frame of reducing prices, um, as tempting as it is, because uh, one of the outcomes of privatization for four decades has been huge underinvestment, and particularly in areas like water and energy generation um, and, and in rail, there is a huge backlog of infrastructure investment that needs to be done. And that is inevitably in tension with the ability to drastically reduce prices. And so while I understand the appeal of a three-word pitch, and I think that is a good thing to have, um, bills will be lower might end up setting up a, a trap for yourself when you can't lower bills as much as you may have implied you would. Great to be in a position where one, one might be trapped by not reducing bills as much as uh, previewed. Um, 
uh, the, uh, the, there was some effort put into trying to phrase the objectives so that the savings from public ownership might be redistributed between uh, uh, price reductions and extra investments. Uh, so that can be done in advance. But I quite honestly uh, am convinced that the, the savings are so great in all these areas uh, that uh, uh, nationalisation will reduce your bills is a very safe, um, a very safe promise. Um, just to, but in terms of commit to be for the states, okay, one way of doing that is looking at what's happening in other countries. Uh, we can point people to Germany, we can point people to what uh, Stadtwerke Munich are doing, uh, a, a municipal uh, company that is actually the biggest developer of offshore wind in the Irish Sea. Uh, at the moment, and so on and so forth. So we've got lots of good international examples uh, for doing that. For Royal Mail in decline, I think it's a, it's a classic argument. I think Royal, the lead service of Royal Mail is something that might just also get taken into public ownership in the course of this government, um, because its uh, shareholders are not managing to make it workable. And I think the way of doing that is to uh, say, okay, we rebuild it. We look at what you can do with a comprehensive nationwide network of Workers who are going to everybody's door every day, and what France has done for example is to start using them to, as part of the social care plan for elderly people. Uh, it also uses the post office for banking services, uh, and I think one can extend that into thinking about the possibility of developing other wholesale uh, and, uh, uh, software services. Um, that's, I'll leave other people to talk about other things. Except just quickly on the pensions thing, uh, the, the the view on uh, pension uh, fund shareholdings was that uh, it was relatively small. It's only five percent of the relevant companies, and also that the impact uh, should not be exaggerated. If we, I, I mean, I estimated that it was amounted to. Point not one of a percent of the value of pension fund shareholdings, and that that was less than the average daily fluctuation of stock market investments. So it gets lost in the overall risk pooling mix of pension fund investments. Um, on the framing point, uh, so I think I think it's interesting sort of outcomes versus process. We we put an unofficial, unscientific poll of our supporters and we ask them why they care about public ownership and the thing that comes out top again and again is it's a moral issue public services should be run for people not profit and I think people feel really strongly that you know profit shouldn't be going into shareholders pockets when they could be, be reinvested back into services whether that's to lower bills whether it's to invest in infrastructure I think that really top level message kind of cuts through for people um, on the uh, hyper-local uh, battles with the media, I just wonder if we can do something copying Liverpool. I think they had a, a higher result for Labour than compar comparable places, and they don't have the sun in there, um, I think is my understanding. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, you know, that would be a great campaign, um, and it would start to, to push back against um, that, kind of, that kind of dominance. Um, and on, yeah, how to convince people the state is capable. We did a little video on the top 10 European countries where public ownership is totally normal. Um, please do check it out. Uh, as Dave said, you know, the French post office, uh, Scottish water, Danish wind power, you know, the examples go on and on. Um, and we need to be talking about them and making sure that we're very, very clear that what we're asking for here is not radical. Um, and actually the extreme <coughs> ideological position is to insist that private companies have to do everything all of the time. You know, that's quite an extreme position that we've got to after, you know, as Matt outlined, what, where Thatcher got us to, really. Um, and also, you know, how, how to convince people that the state is capable. Let's use all these great policies that we've developed. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to plug this again. I've brought a whole bunch of copies in a rucksack. Um, so please don't make me take them home again. Um, and so that they're free, help yourselves. Um, these are ideas um, that are very close to Labour's around you know, how we make sure public ownership really delivers um, what people need. And maybe we haven't got there yet, but we will. Thanks. Um, so on the laboratories of democracy and what would city mayors do potentially, um, 
given they've got relatively limited powers, what I'd potentially um, say they should do is given they often regulate transport, they should set up a sort of transport data trust in which any private company operating, but particularly a platform company, addition of license alongside you know, better labour rights is the pooling of data that currently is generated by workers on Uber, but Uber cannibalise and they're using to basically plot the downfall of TFL and other public transport networks. And that's a system which, like, you know, the data that workers generate, you know, fuels their growth, fuels their machine learning, fuels their capacity to sort of, you know, privately plan, and that really should be a public good. And with that, you can then, you know, you can open that data up, that publicly owned data, or collect rights to that data up to workers, who can then recognise that where they're being screwed over, where their hours are sort of not sufficient, etc., etc. So it really rebalances the asymmetry of power in the sort of in, sort of employment relationship that's obviously sort of legally denied by the companies that exists, and also allows the public sector to sort of democratically plan transport systems and meet needs through accessing that data much more effectively. And I think that's within their sort of actual sort of territory of powers, I think that's one thing that would be interesting um, and forward. And I think um, uh, on the state, um, I sort of mentioned Stuart Wall earlier, and that's um, reading over Christmas, the long road to renewal, or the hard road to renewal, so you know, there's nothing new under the sun in that sense. Um, but one of his pieces are is, uh, the state socialism is old caretaker, so like this, this concern that it's not enough to have public ownership, it's going to be democratic public ownership, and we have to be you know, in and against the state, and these traditions, I think A, Kat's shown that that's very much where 21st century sort of state ownership is. It's decentralised, it's democratic, and B, that was you know, fundamental to the agenda that Labour developed. I think if you look at their democratic public ownership consultations, etc. So I think that it's absolutely a concern to be to raise, but I think it's absolutely where the sort of democratic public ownership agenda is seeking not sort of the state as is, but a sort of state that's porous and open and participant and democratic. Um, on the on sort of Pensions, and I mean, I think it's a, both a media point, but I think just more broadly, I think um, one avenue of advance, which I know sort of you and one of the questioners has sort of done work on, one of the avenues I think that hopefully you know, the left move into in the years ahead is how we democratise pension funds and how do we challenge the power of asset management, uh, who are sort of such key nodal points in the allocation of, sort of investment, you know, voting rights within companies, etc., etc., and that is ultimately our money, uh, as uh, someone mentioned. And I think there's a, some problems around that narrative, but I think fundamentally challenging and democratising how asset management works, including using you know, TUC pensions not to invest in whatever it's currently invested in, but actually to build up real forms of solidarity and work today could be a really useful way and more strategic way of building up power in the here and now rather than waiting for five years. Okay, on the questions to a certain extent that may not have been covered, uh, just on the pension issue though, uh, the point that Dave made, most of the pension funds I met throughout this last period is they had a very limited amount of investment in these sectors, um, partly because of the instability of some of the sectors as well. Um, but also what was interesting is twofold, in the pension funds and asset managers I met, the pension funds in particular, they wanted stability of return over a long period of time. And they weren't necessarily getting that, particularly in the water industry and elsewhere where there was spectacular highs and sometimes lows as well. And what we were offering there is, is bonds, government bonds, which would have given them that stable income that they wanted. Interestingly enough as well, most of the asset managers and pension fund managers were um, coming to our door, knocking at our door, because they also wanted to be alongside our National Investment Bank in, in, in investing in the structures that we were developing, particularly around energy, that they could again secure a stable investment over a long period of time. I suppose some of the lessons we need to learn from the recent past is on the issue of, of cost um, and the point that Kat made, in terms of the media that was one of the big attacks on us, this would cost the earth, and they exaggerated, figures were just ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous, and what we, our standard response was Parliament will decide the price etc. And yet all our research demonstrated that actually it was relatively small and would, any borrowing that we undertook would be paid for from the incomes, the profits that would be made by these individual sectors. I think maybe what we could do is uh, we need to elaborate that argument much more and, and front it head on. And although after, after four year and a half years of today interviews where it was thrown at me almost on a daily basis, um, I still think we can refine the argument a lot better. The second thing as well, as the point that um, Matt made earlier, 
Um, we had a 10-year program for investment. That's what we were looking at. On our public ownership programs, we never really timetabled. <coughs> and what may be one of the things that we should discuss is uh, uh, when, you, when we go into government next, that there is a, a real program for that first five years and then looking indicatively at that second five years. Now, we were moving towards that, but that includes quite tough choices. And it's better to make those choices as a movement rather than when, as you near towards a, an election of any sort. So actually saying, yes, water, you know, water might be our first priority in that first period, in that first year or so. The second will be rail, doing it that way. And in that way, people will look at a more concrete plan uh, in, in how we do, develop it overall. In terms of the media, <laughs> in terms of the media, the reality is this. Um, the vast proportion of the press, as exactly has been said, is by owned by our opponents. You know, th these people aren't going to give up their wealth and power easily. And at the same time, most of the people who own them um, are, are people we're going to confront in terms of tax avoidance, aren't we? So they're not necessarily going to be the most superlative supporters of our program going into government. So we have to recognize that, but we have to be more professional about how we relate to the mainstream media. The problem that we had this time around, unlike in 2017, was twofold. And I mentioned it earlier. One is the mainstream media affected, in, infected the broadcast media much more effectively this time around. Uh, and that included the BBC. And this is not a conspiracy theory, that's just the reality of it. Because again, part of that relates to the cuts that have gone on within the BBC as well. Because if you uh, erode, for example, the, the journalistic um, mass within the BBC, of course then, what do they do? They resort to lifting stuff from the mainstream media, almost unchallenged. And less and less um, investigative journalism goes on now within the BBC and elsewhere than in the past, not because the journalists aren't of a good quality or anything like that, but because of the cuts that have taken place. So one of the points that was made earlier about the defending the BBC is absolutely critical for us. We've got to defend public service broadcasting, but yes, at the same time, hold it to account. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the dilemma, it is a bit of walking a tightrope, because when you start criticising the BBC, that then lends into the opponent's arguments of <coughs> cutting the licence fee or making it, as someone proposed today, optional. Gary Lineker, I think it was. <laughs> Let's not go there on his salary. Um, but again, the issue there is yes, how do we ensure that we hold the mainstream media to account? How do we try and prevent the, as a result of the cuts in the BBC and elsewhere, the infection of the broadcast media so thoroughly as it did this time? But then the reality is, is that we do have to construct our own media in every possible form that we can. I, there's been attempts in the past to establish a a trade union or a labour movement newspaper, a, a tabloid, etc., and most of which have failed because of the, 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 the capital costs involved. But also, the reality is, if you look at the numbers of circulations of newspapers, they're in rapid decline. Um, the, the sun itself is no longer the scale that had before. The Daily Mail, there are some blessings in life. The Daily Mail <laughs> circulation is going down as well, and the Daily Express nearly dead. Now, so the reality is most people now no longer get their information from the press. They will get it online. So that's why in 2017 the organic development of social media for us was so successful. But of course the Tories learned a lesson from that and then colonised that section. Now Twitter is almost like a no-go zone for rational debate at the moment, isn't it? Um, so that's why Instagram became important to us and other mechanisms of Facebook as well. So we've got to be ahead of the game all the time. And the point that Matt made as well, we've got to be creatively ahead of the game in looking at what new platforms that we can develop too. Now, there was a conference a couple of years ago I spoke at where we were talking about cooperative platforms for um, data, etc. We've got to start looking at that again. And do we just have to be more creative as, as, as one media platform becomes colonised by our opponents, recognise that you need to move on to something else and create that more effectively. 
I actually also think word of mouth is quite useful every now and again too. And the, you know, the, the way in which we've built up mass movements is quite important as well, whether through public meetings, rallies, demonstrations, picket lines or, or whatever. We mustn't neglect that either, particularly as a late party now we're half a million members who can all talk on doorsteps, etc. That's why I think in building that social movement, I think we've got to root it in the real struggles within our communities. Which comes up to the final point I was going to make. The examples that people are saying that need to be, this point Matt has made, that need to be developed so that we can point to examples, particularly within our communities. Community wealth building was one of the big things that we've been pushing for the last, well, eight or nine years, some of us, but in the, certainly built it into this manifesto. And if you look at where community wealth building has been developed by Labour councils, it is about insourcing and it is about the development of ideas and initiatives where we can demonstrate that actually a public service, democratically owned and controlled, is outstripping the, any local private um, provision, private company provision, both by way of quality of delivery, but also by way of the input of the, that within the local economy, and also by way of the treatment of the workforce <laughs> as well. So I think that the development of the community wealth building that we put in the manifesto and worked hard on is one of the areas that we can go through on that. And local government, it becomes so much more important for us now in this coming period because that's where we'll want to point to in terms of the ideas that we want to develop and put into practice. Can I also say as well that, again, which doesn't seem to be picked up by, God help us the guardian, but there you are. Um, you know, we put a lot of work in, and people in this room did as well, into demonstrating that we want to develop the cooperative economy. Uh, we said in our manifesto, which I thought, first time round was a bit limited, that we'd double the cooperative sector. Actually, most of us in our speech so we'd go well beyond that. And we had a, a really detailed working group producing the policies on the ground that would translate that into the development of a cooperative economy. And again, all of that, I think we just need to recognise that a lot of work was done, but maybe it is, does come down to the communication. Well, finally, on the employer inclusive ownership fund, which was about the distribution of shares to workers themselves. That's what pushed the city over the edge. That's, the amount of attacks was unbelievable. As soon as you said to these larger companies in particular, your workforce over a 10 year period, hardly revolutionary, is gonna own collectively 10% of your shareholding. Now I didn't think that was particularly challenging or demanding or whatever, but it obviously, I felt like I felt like going to the city and actually setting up counselling sessions for some of them about that. But just think about it though. How, if we communicate that effectively, it is that stakeholder economy that everyone's been arguing for for 30 <coughs> years. It gives a, a direct financial benefit to large numbers of people who actually are not earning great wages either. But in addition to that, it does give them the opportunity of a democratic say over the future of their workplace and their company as well. And I think it's one of those foundational policies for the future. And it's interesting, so far in the leadership debates, it's a policy whose, dare, whose name dare not be mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's one of those things we need to talk about much more. Because I think it could be a game changer, exactly as Matt said, as in the Council of Sales in the 80s was for, for Thatcher. Because it does bring on board a lot of people who go to work and feel they have no stake, no matter how hard they work and don't get the benefits that they feel they should from the investment that, of time and labour that they put into their companies. Rant over. Um, look, thanks a lot for coming. Can I thank the panel for... The <laughs>